Easy. All right. I want you to, to take me back. Obviously, um, <laughs> where, where Nourished is is now, we'll, we'll get to and, and definitely want to, um, the brand itself and what you guys are looking to do and where you guys are looking to do in the future as well is something that I'm really excited to talk about. But can you bring, bring us up to speed? You know, how did we get to this point? Where did it all start? Yes. Um, I think as a, yeah. as a PT, I think all of us have at one point just like thought about potentially doing some meal prep for clients on some level. Um, so I'm also interested to know what was the precursor to actually taking <gasps> doing it. Yeah, look, it was much more selfish than that. Um, we, I say we, cause my husband and I, well now husbands, um, founded the business together and we were, he's a mechanical engineer by trade. Um, and was working this big job in Brisbane and I was in marketing and working this big job on the Gold Coast and commuting back and forth. And we were on a pretty good wicket at that point. So we were like, let's just get food delivered. You know, we were deep into CrossFit. I was deep into CrossFit um, and paleo and I'm gluten intolerant. He's lactose intolerant. And we were literally sitting in a cafe, the paleo cafe, um, one Sunday morning and let's just, let's just get food delivered. We cannot do another meal prep Sunday. It's the whole day to do meal prep for the week. And uh, we grew with it. And, you know, there were some companies around at the time. This was almost eight years ago. But no one was really, well, no one was doing what we needed for our dietary requirements, but also all of these healthy meal delivery companies, it was just bullshit. Um, and let me know if I swear too much for no, you. No. <laughs> but it was like, it was bullshit. You know, you, the rules around what you can advertise with food are a joke. Well, there, there aren't any rules or the rules that exist are so freaking archaic and you can say pretty much whatever you want to say and you don't really need any evidence to back it up um and so there are all these health food companies but processed sugars and preservatives and sources where they then wouldn't list the ingredients that were in the sources and for some companies healthy meant less than 300 calories and everything was one portion size but marketed to all people and we just kind of thought, well, this is ridiculous. And uh, I don't really like my job at the time. So Dave, my husband, says to me, well, we should just do it. We should just make our own and, and sell it. And a week later, I quit my job. And six weeks later, we launched the <laughs> website, which was silly uh, when you think about it this far on. But, you know, like being naive was so good for us right in the beginning. We didn't know that you couldn't start a company in six weeks and we didn't know that you couldn't launch a food company if you weren't a qualified chef or a trained nutritionist or you weren't a food scientist um we just did it and it has evolved from from there from our first week we made 77 meals that pops up in my little report i get every day um, most of those were family that I'm sure we're not paying <laughs> at the time. Um, but yeah, that's where it, it all started out of a really selfish reason. We wanted it. No one was doing it. We did it. Yeah. And was it to start, was it super basic? Was it like everyone's having, you know, steamed rice with grilled chicken breast and cold? It milk? was, I a little bit judged the people that bought our food <laughs> initially it was i mean we were lucky because there was no other um we started as caveman kitchen that was our brand and we were a paleo food company so no one was doing that at the time um and there were a lot of people there hard up for some meal prep that bought it but it was it was basic yes there were i think 10 meals available a week um, and maybe 20 meals in total. And we had, you could buy five or you could buy 10. That was it. There was no customization, no in between. Um, and we really quickly launched portion sizes because we knew that one of the things that pissed me off the most with other company companies was being told that, well, you're a five foot three woman with a desk job, but we're going to sell you the same portion size that we're telling a six foot five tradie to eat. And it, it just made no sense to us. So we started out with our standard and large size portions 
um, and then quickly added the athlete portion in there because such a big market for us were CrossFitters, bodybuilders, weightlifters who did need that bigger portion size. And we really deliberately stayed away from men's and women's um, because that's ridiculous. Similarly to, you know, five foot three woman and six foot five male tradie, it goes in reverse as well. When we're working with Olympic weightlifting women versus guys that have a desk job, yeah, they, they probably need to eat more. We don't need to shame women into, no, you have to have these tiny little portion sizes or shame dudes into, well, you should, you should be eating more. You're obviously too skinny. Um, and we've really, we've kept that the whole way through. We still have that portion sizing and every now and then someone comes and says, well, what's the women's plan? And we're like, no, what's the human plan? Yeah. What does your body need? Your genitalia is not, is one factor of many, not the whole in this. Did you find um, you get that initial kind of like, I guess, uh, baptism of fire as well, where it's like you kind of just encountering different problems every week and trying to solve them and all of a sudden that becomes the policy? Yes. And seven years on, those, that's no different. Um, someone told me really early on in the piece, maybe a couple of years in, that the biggest problem people have is that they think they shouldn't have any problems. Yeah. And it was just a game changer so now i worry about not having enough problems not having enough challenges you know perfection is not something that exists so but or but something we're always striving for so you know if i look at my to-do list or the team's to-do list it's like well why aren't we making the product better we should always be making the product better we should always be iterating how we serve it to um, our customers we should always be talking to people in different ways depending on on what they need and if we don't have problems we got a big problem yeah yeah even not having problems is a problem right yep yep <laughs> like you you be doing late nights and, and long days and stuff like that especially in the beginning when you're trying to get your systems down and it's like you get to choose your problems this way though, right? Like you care more about the problems and not just like inconveniences. It's like you actually go out there with the intention to solve, which I think makes a big difference, that perspective. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things about not being in corporate. I mean, that's a whole other podcast, I'm sure. Um, but when there is a problem, I get to actually solve it. You, know, you work in these big companies and you spend years talking about an issue and then maybe you'll do something about it um even just the size of our company and how nimble we try to stay we're not a startup anymore but we try to have a startup mentality it means that if we have to make an iteration on a meal we can do it within a couple of weeks we don't have to have a nine to 18 month life cycle for development and testing and, and all of these things our systems let it do it a lot quicker and our ability to admit when we've got something wrong you know we sometimes we put a product out there and it just fails it just falls flat on its ass and rather than push it and push it and push it because we developed it well that's all right it took a few weeks to develop it will take a few weeks to get over move on let's keep doing what's right for the market for the customer and for us and all of our staff um yeah so from from i guess eight years ago too when you first started like even crossfit in itself was still pretty young still pretty new like um, yes. a little bit kind of done I feel like now it's been accepted as a sport it's not like oh you do CrossFit now they're, people they're, are like oh yeah that's a sport <laughs> they're trying to do their best to make that as hard as possible I guess like, <laughs> changing everything every year um, but yeah I think that yeah, there's always a not necessarily a, a luck involved but definitely the timing you know worked out well you, you know that's not like because it, it almost seems now it's it's kind of like the the opposite a little bit to, to what you, you kind of stated it was eight years ago where it's you know, it's still a lot of the healthy marketing, but there's a lot of um, dogmatic nutrition approach to meal prep companies that are specifically doing like one aspect or another. Yeah. Um, so it's almost Yeah, it's kind of exploded and now it's starting to really niche down um, a little bit. So last I read there were 200 meal prep brands in Australia some delivered to the door, some in supermarkets um, or various other places. And it did just really explode and everything was trying to be everything to everyone. And, you know, companies like 5.4 did really well right out the gate um, and unfortunately aren't around anymore because they weren't able to keep iterating their product, but also because these really niche 
brands came onto the market. You've got Gardener Vegan, who just does vegan, and Solara, they just does vegan. Then you've got other just purely vegetarian. There's a couple of purely keto ones dropping off. Um, some that are very specifically targeted at fast, fast, fast fat loss um, that I have opinions about that I probably shouldn't <laughs> share. Definitely get into um, whereas <laughs> we just try to stick with being uncomplicated. Um, which was actually part of the why we rebranded from Caveman Kitchen to Nourish because we did, you know, we started out as a paleo food company really serving a CrossFit community. And, you know, that timing, you're right, was just so perfect for us. There were boxes popping up all over the place. We had no marketing budget at all. We could pretty much afford to get some posters and flyers printed. So we just went around to every CrossFit gym that we could foot pedal it around to and said, this is what we're doing. This is who we are. We think that we can help your customers get better friend times, heavier lifts, faster 5k runs, because you know, and we know that nutrition is the most important aspect of that, but your clients don't. And so they're continuing to fuck it up and uh, stop their own progression. So let's help you with that. Um, so for the first 18 months, that was entirely how we sold. We didn't have a single customer that wasn't part of a CrossFit gym. And then word started getting out around different, um, paleo groups and health food groups. And, um, we did some really great work with, uh, Google and organic search to start getting out to people. Um, a couple of years later, we expanded into Sydney and Melbourne and now we're all through there, South Australia, Tassie. Um, so a lot of people are finding us online where they weren't before, but I think I'm just completely diverging off your question here. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the market. It is starting to consolidate. Um, and I'm really excited to see these niche brands that are, are coming through as well at, about people saying you're all you're all actual individuals with yeah. individual wants and needs and this one blanket approach doesn't have to fit everybody. It's, it sounds like it's, I guess, a similar conversation to, to one that we had last week uh, when we caught up talking about, you know, there's so much uh, competition, but not necessarily against each other, right? More so against like, you know, you guys competing against like your big food chains and stuff like that, rather than like the other you know, individuals that are trying to do their vegan meal prep and then that sort of stuff. Is that a fair call? Yeah. I'm a massive fan of collaboration. Um, I'm actually also a massive fan of competition. You know, I live in Australia. It's a capitalist market. I think people are foolish to think that they shouldn't have any competition. They're foolish to try and stamp on everybody else in the business. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said there weren't people around that are doing that and people that wanted that. And, a grab for market share is definitely a big part of strategy for some of the companies around, but then there's the rest of us that are just trying to do good shit and impact people's lives in a really positive way. And, you know, we can work together and we cannot, the, the pie is huge. There are enough slices for everyone. You know, this is going to be a billion dollar industry in Australia really soon. There's enough pie. Um, to go around and you know we work with a couple of other players coming together for purchasing power or just to talk to each other about the shit that goes on with couriers or with other suppliers or in the industry just to prop each other up um, the CEO over at Canella which is a disability meal prep and delivery company him and I have regular catch-ups just to check in on each other's mental health and to talk about the things that we can't talk about with anybody else because no one else gets it. That is so nice. Yeah. It's so nice to know that I have that. I never once think, God, I wish Canella didn't exist because I might have more business. Like I'd much rather that they existed. So I felt like I had some support and someone that just understood what we're dealing with. It's so much nicer to, to be like that. I feel like ultimately that does get rewarded though. Like I feel like ultimately as a brand, when you are trying to do right, it takes a little bit longer, but once you kind of get moving, yeah. like you earn where you get to and you're more likely to like hold, I feel rather than trying to yeah. just pull the wall over the eyes and, and see what happens in a short term. like time. Yeah. Back. That was really important to us from really early on that we grew 
or we created a really solid foundation. Um, you know, I think startup companies are great and raising money is great and growing really quickly if it works is great, but how often is that foundation just too unsteady and everything falls over? And my goal and my husband's goal was not world domination. It was not to IPO or cash out at hundreds of millions. Like what would, what would you even do with hundreds of millions of dollars? I would find that so much more stressful than how I, you know, live now or lived when we first started because the responsibility is just do whatever you huge. want. You know, we're just <laughs> right. And it's terrifying the idea of that. Um, so we wanted to build a solid foundation for two reasons. One, so that, we would always be able to take care of our staff. We never wanted our team to feel insecure about their jobs or like the ground could be ripped out from under them at at any point. So for me, the vision of our company is to have real and positive impact on the health of humans. And that is so much about our customers. But for me as the CEO, it's equally as about my team and how I can impact them every day. And one of the greatest things I can do for them is give them job security. Um, and then the other was that by going a bit slower, we could have systems and processes that would scale up with us. We could have product that would scale up with us. We could find the right suppliers whose values aligned with ours. So we didn't end up tolerating shit because we just didn't have time to do, um, anything else. I'm super proud of being a I mean I call us a slow growth company I think by government definition it's the opposite um but I'm really proud of that and I've watched companies come and go over the last seven years and I'm watching companies now that are gonna go um and are gonna implode and and I feel for them I think if everybody didn't just go chasing money and market share from day dot but really thought about it and really created something that was solid, um, that they might still be around. Yeah. So take me, take me through. Okay. So we, we've done our first week. We had 77 meals. Uh, <laughs> yeah. at, at what point do you guys get to, Hey, we're going to need to to bring someone on to help. Um, mm. I feel like for, for every business, especially every small business, that moment you make that decision to like, let someone else in is the moment that, you know, it becomes real now right? You can't just yeah. and, and walk away. And I guess giving your stuff job security is, is one of the real reasons behind that. I remember um, when we first brought Maggie on as, as kind of like our first team member, it was like, this is, you know, someone else is hitching their wagon now to our ride, right? Like it's, yeah. if something like we're now responsible for more people than, than just ourselves, which is awesome that you get to that point, but also like terrifying. Oh, dude, the weight of responsibility is, insane it it is really i'm I, I nothing good to tell you there it doesn't ever go away and the more stuff you have uh it gets worse. the harder that is mind. yeah it makes you uh a little more risk adverse so like early on when you're more willing to go oh, fuck it, let's just try that and see what happens now you know we do a bit more research and we spend a bit more time um thinking about it i definitely have high functioning anxiety and i would say a most of that stems from I need to make sure I can pay my staff next week and the week after and and the week after that um and then now that I have kids it comes from well fuck I can't just move into my mom's house again there's tiny humans that I got to worry about um here as well and it doesn't ever go away but I also would never want it to because I think that's when people start making stupid decisions um with their money and what they do with it so right back from the beginning we did have one other um, team member, Clancy, Clancy the cook, because I can't cook for shit. No one's letting me do anything. Um, and uh, Dave is a great, he's a fantastic cook. He's designed our entire menu, um, which is mind blowing when you think that a mechanical engineer has just designed this big, beautiful <laughs> menu that we have. Um, but we needed someone that could actually be in the kitchen making it happen with us. So, he came on really, really early on. We'd put in a little bit of um, seed money, which was just our own savings. And we knew that that needed to get us to a certain point and then we needed to be profitable. The really cool thing about our business model up until we introduced NDIS was that people paid us before we had to buy anything. So we would take orders up until, you know, a certain time on a Wednesday and then we would put our produce orders in. So by the time we've got to pay our suppliers, we've already been paid. 
um, I think I mentioned before, we moved into my mum's house or my, my parents' house for about 18 months and lived off very little, very little. Um, it bodes well for us that we started a food company because at least we could feed ourselves. But it was a good solid couple of years and pretty much all we did was work um, in that time. We were smart about it though with looking after ourselves and our health you know I hear about these founders and startup companies where people are working 18 20 22 hours a day and surviving on caffeine and I think that it just would have get, gone against the whole philosophy of our business so you know I trained every day and we each took at least one day off um, a week to do that and we adapted really quickly to our own working style so I like to get up really early and I like to start work really early, but I like to finish by about three, three thirty in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Dave prefers to get up a little bit later and work a little bit later, but we tried to be, we tried to really hold each other accountable to our own health because neither of us were going to be able to do that long term. Um, if we didn't take care of that, I don't want to, you know, sound like I'm on my high horse here. There are definitely times when that didn't happen. You know, at one point, we were about three weeks away from having to just shut it down. It just wasn't meeting our needs. We were burning cash um, faster than we were bringing it in. We had our head in the finances enough to know that we were, we had to call it quits. We, we were always going to call it quits while we could still play, pay all of our supplies and all of our staff. We were never going to not be able to do that. And when we were three weeks away, yeah, that's the days we were pulling. 20 <laughs> days just doing everything that we could to try and turn it around um not so intelligently i was also about 25 weeks pregnant at the time so um i can't imagine that that was great for my unborn child who is fine now she has no health problems but you know you you got to do what you got to do sometimes yeah, we were, I guess, uh, blessed with, with how we sort of got started in terms of um, being online. So overheads are pretty normal from the start. And we had, um, had well, we were basically surviving off cats nursing income. Um, I mm. just moved to Canada, like sold everything, had like a little bit of like, I guess, like egg money, like egg nest, nest money. Um, but it was like, cool, I guess we see what happens. And um, my worst case scenario is always like, guess I just get on a plane and go home if this like doesn't right. work. Yeah. yeah, I'll go pull coffee. I'll go pour beers. I'll like, you know, I'll do what I need to to get it done. Does anyone say to you now, like, oh, you're so lucky? Not quite. I don't think we're quite at that point yet. Um, but I feel like, I definitely feel like the word luck has definitely changed for me in terms of what I think it means and what it actually means. Like, I've always believed that like, oh, uh, you're like 10 years in making your overnight success. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. so, um, and I used to think a lot that like, that there was one particular event or one particular moment that was going to change the game for us that was going to like bring us from like this kind of area of like uh, obscurity and help us like advance like wider than just our our network of like friends and um, you know affiliates and and stuff like that and what I've noticed is uh, it's not any one big event but it's like everything that we're doing on like every front that's like slowly working together and together and together and now when you look back five years you see how far you've come but it wasn't one thing in particular um so i think my, great. yeah i think my understanding of luck has has changed and so when people get yeah, do sort of mention like it's not what you think it is it's just like that operation uh, operation um preparation meeting opportunity mm. yeah i totally agree i get asked about luck a lot not a lot i've been asked about it a couple of times and i I don't like the word because I think it makes people feel like uh, you didn't do the work and also like they could just do it at any second, which I mean, if that helps you sleep at night, great. But I think I I acknowledge the privilege that I was born into. You know, I was born into a middle-class white family in Australia. That's some fucking privilege right there. But what I chose to do with that was not luck. That was just... (laughs) a lot of hard work, a bit of uh, idiocy on on some part and not having a lot of risk um, at the time, or sorry, not having a lot to lose at the time that we started it. You know, I could move into 
my parents' house and I didn't have to support kids and we didn't have to start with stuff and we didn't need a ton of money to put in right in the beginning. And, you know, if I had to make those same decisions now, there's absolutely no way that, that I would do that. I was just privileged to be in a position and take the opportunities that were in front of me. And look, to be fair, only one person has ever said to me, oh, you're so lucky. And yeah. I wanted to punch them in the face because <laughs> you're right. It's not an overnight success. It's not one great leap. I couldn't, I don't know any successful company that it's been one great leap. It's a thousand tiny steps and then it's a thousand more tiny steps and it's 500 backwards and yeah. then a thousand more tiny steps. And when you're in it, you know, it's really hard to see. It's really, yeah. it's hard to see that you're moving forward because it's just like a grain of sand at a time. Um, and even now, you know, I can look back and say, Oh, we started on 77 and we are where we are now, but it's still on the daily it feels like a tiny creep. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your perspective changes, right? Like the first time we made a thousand dollars in a month, like we were like, over the moon. <laughs> if we had a thousand a month now. I'd be panicked. Like I would be <laughs> right. panic stations. I'd be like, what is happening? Um, but the other word, speaking of luck, the other one I really hate too is talent. When people are always like, oh, you, you're so talented. It's like, like what? You just, you know, like it's kind of the same thing, right? Yes. It's, no, it's I'm like, just an average it's person. More, it's more of a cop out, you know, for them to say, oh, like how lucky are you that you're born with like X, Y, and Z and that like you're so talented. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, it doesn't really work like that. Yeah, we're not talking about basketball here and you were born with height. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I do not have above average intelligence, Jesus. Nobody would argue that. It's just willingness to put everything on the line and then perseverance to keep going with it. And having, I, I mean, I guess the only smart part of it was picking the right opportunity at the right time. So there's opportunity. It's like it's floating around everywhere. Mm-hmm. You just have to get it at that right time. Um, and we, we just happened to do that. I mean, some would argue that we were too late, um, in it or that we didn't maximize it enough when it was, but for our goals, for our life and what we wanted to create, it was the right time. Would I go into this market now? Absolutely not. There's 200 brands of pre-made meals in this country. There's three major players, two of which just raised a shit ton of money. There's no way I'd go into this market now. Um, but there would be plenty of other opportunities that I would take. Now, this was always going to be the pathway. This nourished is just what it happened to look like. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, opportunities need a good or bad. And it's, it's more so uh, the ones that you choose to take that, that sort of like define who you are. But I think for us, and I know this is kind of a, a subject matter that, that's close to your heart too. One of the first things we did once we started working with people was like, okay, if we're going to do this, like what, what, what's our mission statement? Like, what are our values? Like, what do we actually stand for? Um, and when you understand those and you really think about those and you don't have a hundred of them, you only have four or five, right? Um, it makes those opportunities easier to determine which ones are right and wrong because yes. you know what's concurrent with what you're actually in business for or what you're actually trying yeah. to achieve. Right? Yeah. And again, removing the luck out of it, right? And the chance. Yeah. And it really just helps. You're right. It helps with focus um, because there's a million opportunities. We could do this. We could do that. We could do this. We're like, okay, what is the vision to have real and positive impact on the health of humans? Now, we do that mostly through the delivery of beautiful, healthy, wholesome food. But for me now that I have a team in place that's really taking care of that and doing it so brilliantly, I get to look at what does the rest of that mean? What is, you know, there's a reason that that vision statement doesn't say food because health is so much more than that. It's mental health, which we can see in our values. We're humans before numbers, start with kindness, think without limitations. How do we start impacting people in that space? Um, And so we work a lot with our customer care team on, not just solve the problem for the person, but give them an amazing experience. Yeah. Make what they are grateful for today this interaction because you don't know what they've got going on. Maybe this is the only positive thing that happens for their mental health today. Maybe you change the whole course of the day or the week or the month of the year for them just from this one interaction. And then I get to say, what else can we impact in this space? Well, we're working with disability and we're working with aged care now. 
both systems that are so messed up so in Australia, so broken. We can have real and positive impact here, not just in food, but in the way that policy is shaped in the way that distribution is shaped in the way that just the treatment of human beings are shaped and then from a food perspective how do we educate people not just say hey come and buy from us and never leave but say we're we're going to acknowledge that you'll be with us for a period of time for some people that's years and for some people that's weeks but in that time how do we educate you to make better decisions for yourself for your own physical health and your own mental health because for a lot of years i didn't know how to do that until i found this way of eating which is entirely uncomplicated you know i just eat real food but before that the health problems i had with endometriosis with pcos with my gluten intolerance with asthma were so significant that i would never want other people to be living like that just because they don't have that education about nutrition and education about themselves and things you don't need to go out and spend years and years and years getting a degree just to make basic changes to understand yourself now by all means we engage nutritionists we engage dietitians we think that the research and all the everything that's going on that field is so important and we just want to take that and package it up for people in really simple digestible (laughs) pun intended, um, way so that they can learn how to live a healthier, easier, simpler life. Yeah. I think the, the longer that we have MTMM, the, like, the more we've noticed that the actual nutrition part of what we do is such a, a significant but such a small role. Yep. You know? um, and, and it ultimately gets to the point where it's like, hey, we're not actually talking necessarily about what you are or aren't eating it's like how are you talking to yourself and you know what is your like understanding of like what you're here to do and what you want to do and what's your self-worth and you know why do you, why do you talk to yourself like that and mm-hmm. that you just realize you know, how deep things like food really like go to the core of someone right and it is so much more than just like protein carbs fats right? yeah it's so behavioral it's like how do we how do we not change what you eat, but how do we start to make changes to your behavior and your understanding so that you can make better decisions? Like I would love for people to come to us, buy our product for a few weeks, learn about themselves, their bodies, what they like, what they react to, and then go away and be able to do that for themselves. Most people actually like cooking. I don't understand them one iota, but if you like it, and you know what to do with it, that's awesome. I, I love that and I want that for everyone. I'd much rather that than they stayed with us for years on end and learned nothing about it and then ultimately left and, and ended up unhealthy again. You know, when I go traveling, I obviously don't have nourished available to me, but I know what I can and can't tolerate. I know it's going to make me feel good and not make me feel good. And it's really important, I think, especially, you know, for girls and I was young when I started this company I was 26 I just thought that I looked and felt a certain way and that that was so different to what I saw in media or what I saw on Instagram and there were two shifts for me with that one was finding out that I was gluten intolerant and so actually I was just bloated all the time but two was that mental side of it and that behavioral side of it that not everybody looks the same and that there are such things as filters and I've been researching a little bit the amount of work that women have to do to pose on Instagram to get the shot. Sweet Jesus. They're all going to have back issues when they're old because the positions that they have to put themselves into, you know, even just last year, I thought I had such bad skin. I was like, no one else looks like me. What is going on? I feel like I'm doing the right things for it. It was just filters. It was Instagram filters. So I stopped using Instagram for a while. Now I use it again and I, I do not filter anything, any story, any photo I put up there because I would never want somebody else to think that my fakeness is a reality that they should be trying to achieve. That went off on a whole tangent there. You've caught me on International Women's Day. So I've been all up in the women's psychology space this morning. It is, it is as well. I think I'm seeing more and more 
and maybe I'm just a little bit more biased and in tune with it, but it's, it's definitely not just women either that really like succumb to that mm. on social media. Um, and I, I think people forget ultimately too, like social media is like, it's a, it's a choice. Like it's a choice, like what you're inviting into your space to pay attention to, like you're choosing that. So if it makes you feel like shit, why do you keep doing it? Stop consuming it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, after my second, cause I had two kids really close together. They were like 14 months apart and uh, I didn't feel good after my second baby. There'd been no recovery time after the first, um, I was carrying way more weight than I ever had. Um, I wasn't feeling good and I was, was scrolling the gram constantly feeling like shit, feeling like shit. And I realized that this is my feed. Mm-hmm. I choose who goes on here. I choose who I follow. And I went so far as to unfollow people that I am friends with that I like, but who were, and and they weren't even posting negative content. It was them posting themselves running on the beach with their kids or doing this fit thing or looking like this. And I couldn't, for me, it made me feel like shit. So I unfollowed them. Um, And I started bringing in people who were in the same place that I was, who were just starting that kind of, post baby what is my world now how do i um reimagine what i want not bounce back not get this pre-baby body but reimagine what i want for myself and then start to move towards that and like now i'm sure i follow all those people again because now i'm that jerk right that has two toddlers and is super fit and running around in my tiny shorts and, and crop top. And it, if that makes people feel bad, they should not follow me. They should that's, not follow me at all. That's, I, I agree. I'm when people sort of um, attack you on social media too, I'm like, if you don't like gym and food and like, I've got a daughter, like, why are you following me? Like, if you just like yeah. looking for the places to pounce, like this is, you know, um, I want to circle back a little bit. I think, look, the whole pregnancy and, and postpartum, and um, again, that's obviously a topic that's been pretty uh, concurrent here in this house uh, recently as well. And we're kind of at that stage of life too. I think um, seven or eight of our friends have, we've all had our first kind of kid within the same sort of six months, within six months of each other. Um, and a lot of these like friends of ours and, and, and close like knit crew are clients as well. Um, so it's been awesome in that ability to be able to relate and now being able to relate as a parent to other people in the community that are parents when they talk about struggles with time management and, and stuff like that, obviously. <laughs> um, but I've, while Kat was um, pregnant, yeah, have you ever heard street parking? Miranda Oldroyd does that uh, online. It's like CrossFit programming, but it's like online platform. Anyway, oh, no. kind of running that while um, all the gyms were shut. And one of the big things they do is like they do a specific um, program for postpartum and it's all done um, through this like birth fit verification. So I went and did this ver- like this certification in like how to PT and coach through like the, the different stages of pregnancy and postpartum. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about that course was that like there's no such thing as pre-baby body now once you've had a child like you can't go back like your body is forever different and having some of those conversations with our friends where they're like okay i'm like six weeks postpartum like i want to train three four times this week like let's get back into it it's like no like that is not (laughs) it's like me after my first baby yeah you just come out of a car accident like pretty significant physical trauma and you're like itching to get back into throwing weight overhead like it's not gonna be Mm. weeks you know yeah, there's so much that we should talk about before <laughs> before we have babies around your expectations and then what other people will expect of you as well. Because that was me. I was that idiot at six weeks. I'm running. I'm like, woo, I feel good. And then I went to my uh, postpartum physio and she was like, you need to stop. Yeah. There, there will be no running. There will be no lifting um, right now. And it's really hard to adjust like it's really really hard to look in the mirror and not recognize the person looking back at you because I think you know pregnancy is slow it's nine months so you have this kind of gradual adjustment every day and then you get to this like oh beautiful baby bump all awarded and everybody loves to see it and then within a day it's like pack it away yeah yeah, yeah. hide it don't let anyone 
see it and how quickly can you look like you did before? Well, I just grew a fucking human. Maybe I don't want to look like I did before because I grew a human. (laughs) Things change. But I think I certainly went in expecting that, oh, it will just go back to what it was. And I was really fit and healthy before I got pregnant the first time. So it shouldn't take too long um, to do that. And I should look like this. And, you know, Chantel Duncan looked like this five weeks after she had a baby. Well, cool. She's six foot four. Yeah. Her distribution of fat going to be a little different to you at five foot three, but you don't think that you just think, well, she did it. So I should be able to do it. Yeah. We definitely, this whole bouncing back and pre baby body, it's got to go. It's got to just not even be in the vocabulary. It's got to be, Oh, your hips are wider. Sweet. They look amazing. You've got more booty. Fantastic. Yep. There's pigmentation on your skin. You know, no, I didn't know about that. I didn't know how much my skin would change. Um, having kids, it's got to, there's got to be more conversation about it. And then it cannot be backed up with, you should just be grateful. You had a baby, you know, other people can't do that. Other people don't have that same opportunity. So all of a sudden we're tying together your love for your child and your love for yourself. When they're two different things, you are allowed to simultaneously look at your child and think, wow, I made that. That's amazing. And look at yourself and think, I don't recognize this person yeah anymore they're allowed to be two parallel thoughts we had we had a tagline that we'd like figured out how to lose 10 kilos overnight and basically the joke was have the baby right um it's like the only way to to do it um but it it is like how much of that gets normalized with things that like aren't normal right like Hmm. um like pelvic floor weakness and lack of control and like doing double unders and stuff and especially within the crossfit well yeah i can't do them anymore (laughs) Yeah, but, and it's just become like, oh, that's, that happens, you know, that happens. It's like, actually, no, like, that shouldn't happen. Like, that can be, you know, treated and fixed and worked on. But, yeah, it's going to be, you know, you're pregnant for nine months. Let's give ourselves at least the nine months afterwards yes. to try to start to get back to that point, right? Yeah. And look, it is hard when you're in it, when you're used to running at a, not literally figuratively running at a certain pace and achieving certain things to not just want to like jump back into it. And I can fully acknowledge that it's only with retrospect that I can say all these things that I can say, you should slow down, that you should take longer. Cause when you're in it, it is so hard. You know, we were talking the other day about this surgery I've got coming up and I can't train for 10 weeks after that my biggest fear about this surgery is not being able to train for 10 weeks Mm -hmm. after that because that is hard like when that's your whole mental health outlet when it's so much of your identity and it's probably not particularly healthy but so much of what I look like physically is a representation of who I am that I am determined, that I'm hardworking, that I am disciplined. And to be honest, I couldn't give a shit what anybody else sees when they look at me, but they're the things that I want to see in the mirror. And so when I'm not that, which I wasn't post-pregnancy and I won't be post-surgery, it's really hard to work your mental health around that. Well, I still say those, like, those ab- attributes arguably become like, more, in prominent, more prominent and more important now over the next 10 weeks, yeah. right? Yes, I'm on a mission to put on muscle. <laughs> um, we've gone well off topic, which is awesome. I love it. Um, <laughs> one of the podcasts. Um, I want to circle back just to you started touching on the NDIS um, and a little mm. bit of care stuff too. I think that is the most, uh, I think, like genius, I guess, kind of like <laughs> in terms of what I think and what I think a lot of people, especially traditionally, have thought when it comes to meal prep companies and you're right like yeah it's the the crossfitters and it's the bodybuilders and it's like the gym rats and the people that like can't cook but like don't want to eat fast like eat fast food and that kind of middle ground but i think the pivot to um yeah being able to provide like real actual food to like aged care and especially the india how did, did was that just like light bulb moment or was that like something that was always kind of no no and it, but it was one of those cool startup small business iterate really quickly things um we a lady called us up her name was linda in 2017 towards the end of 2017 and she said are you registered as an ndis provider and we're just like no what 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 you talking about lady what is the ndis 
Um, she's like, you know, it's a national disability insurance scheme. It's fairly new. If you register as a provider, I can buy food from you out of my plan that the government gives me. So I pay you a tiny bit and they pay you the rest. Um, and we can only buy it from registered providers. So she helped us. She wanted it and no one else was doing it. So again, that same scenario. So she helped us yeah. look into it. She was the one that sent us, here's the link to where you register. Here's the information um, that you need. And God knows how, but we got it done in three weeks, um, which if you've ever had to deal with government is just a nightmare and certainly would be a much longer process now. Um, but yeah, now 50% of our market is um, with the NDIS. So people, Australians living with disabilities. And it was so commercially smart for two reasons. One, because it diversified our market. So if one drops out, we've got a fail safe going back to that security and foundation building for our team. Um, so if we go into a recession, that's fine. The NDIS is still there. If the NDIS goes away, that's fine. Our general market is still there. And then aged care makes up another part of that portfolio that we're growing into. But the other reason it really made commercially good sense was because we wouldn't still exist without it because I would not have kept going. I needed something more. Um, we, this vision that we have now, we didn't have before NDIS became a part of what we did. It was really just about, hey, let's make really healthy food for the general public, but it's a bit expensive. So it's kind of elitist, only so many people can afford it. Now, like we make some difference mm -hmm. for, for people. We're not just talking about oh, I just don't have time to cook my own food. We're talking about if I didn't have your product being delivered to my home each week, I'd be living in a nursing home and I'm only 24 years old. Yeah. Or I'd be eating tins of tuna. Or, you know, almost 50% of people living with disability in Australia are living on or below the poverty line. So they can barely afford to eat anything, let alone good food. Now we get to introduce this whole other part that says the government will help you eat um, really, really well enter a pandemic and you've got people who normally have support workers coming to their home to cook food for them and they're not coming, um, anymore. And then there's this whole other part where even people that still have someone coming to their home and, and coming into their kitchen and cooking their food for them, that's great, but they're not necessarily, well, they're definitely not a qualified chef. They're probably not qualified nutritionists. I'm sure they're great people, but they're not necessarily the best cooks yeah. out there when we get to say, well, we've got a whole team of chefs um, over here making fucking delicious food that we can deliver to your door. And all of a sudden having a disability doesn't mean you have to eat shit or, or you have to wait. Imagine if your care worker is running late, they're stuck in traffic. It's eight o'clock at night. Tough. You don't get to eat till that person gets there. Or you have a fridge full of food that you chose. So you get to pick what you want to eat. You get to have it when you want to have it and it's accessible for you. You can open it. You can microwave it. You don't have to wait for somebody else to do it for you. You know, that level of independence, the mental health that comes along with that. It just like, it absolutely sparked something um, for me with our customer care team saying to them, you don't have restrictions on how long you talk to a customer for because one of the biggest issues people living with disability have is loneliness. So when they call up to place their order, we might be the only human interaction they have that day or that week. Oh my God, stay on the phone, have a chat, see what's going on with them. Tell them what's going on with you. My team have made friends of some of our customers and people living with disability across Australia. And it's just, it gets me going. It's, yeah. it's so much of the reason I go to work every day. And then, you know, add home care, which is a part of the aged care system into that. And I'm looking at the rate of malnutrition in people over the age of 65, which is a joke. The, the way we treat our seniors in this country is disgusting. And saying, you know what, I want to pick a fight. This pisses me off and I want to make some change here. So my team can do it with meal delivery and I'm going to spend some time over here seeing what we can do about policy because wow I, I don't want to grow old in this country if this is the way we are treating yeah our people yeah. um yeah it's been i obviously get really passionate about it it's yeah, a really it's cool awesome. part of what we do i think it's all i think um 
we're starting to see a change too, right? Where your metrics of success are more about impact than about dollars. And so when you find like those areas where you can actually have an impact, um, it's, it's worth so much more, right? I get, yeah. There's a balance in that. We talk about that a lot, that if we can get the value right, the dollars will follow. Um, And so far that, you know, that is proving to be correct. And I had some guilt for quite a while about not being a social enterprise because that seemed to be kind of the buzz thing. And if you weren't and you were just out for profit, you know, why are you doing it? But this way, no, we're not a social enterprise. We are a for-profit company, but we do really, really good shit and we leave a really, really solid and positive impact along the way. And if the day comes that we're not doing that, we won't exist anymore and i think you need that for longevity right i mean unless money is is a huge motivator for you in which case fucking go for it but for most of us we need more than that it's it or why wouldn't we just go have jobs like i would certainly be paid more if i just went and got a job if i had been working for the last 20 years in corporate i'd be paid a hell of a lot more than i do now but my soul would be non-existent yeah i think when you kill the corporate dream, you realize that like no one can pay you enough for doing shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more, expand a little bit more on, on that wanting to affect change with, with policy and stuff like that. Is there anything specific that you've got mm-hmm. your on? any specific feathers you're trying to like uh, ruffle at the moment? Or? Ah, well, always. Um, at the moment, I am trying to stay focused and true to the original mission for me to have that solid foundation um, and not put the team at risk because of what I want to fight. Um, so I've just hired a general manager. She starts in a couple of weeks um, and she's basically going to take over running the day to day of the company so I can spend more time doing that Um, and to be honest it's a minefield to get your head around and I've never really worked with government uh, until the NDIS and it's a slow moving beast and I don't know how to affect change but I keep meeting people every day that are young and wanting to fight Um, so I'm really looking forward towards the end of this year to having more time to really jump into that scene and say, okay, what can we do? How do we start having a voice here? How do we start shaping change? Um, Because at the moment there's a hell of a lot of lip service. You know, the PM came out just the other day and they're putting this many more million dollars into home care and aged care. But what they're not telling you is that it's not even a third of what they need. They're not telling you that people are still dying, waiting for the money to come through to support them in their senior years or, or through their disability. And I think the best thing we have going for us is that the intention is right and the execution is fucked. So we can fix the execution. It'll take a long time. Um, but if the intent was incorrect, that would be a much bigger issue. So that uh, little bit of Brene Brown there and you try to look at the world as if everyone's trying to do their best, right? Like everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's actually where our start with kindness value comes from. It's actually less about you personally, because we always hire people that would, would do that anyway, but it's about assuming that everybody else actually at their core starts from a place of kindness and that for some people on its way out, it just got distorted, you know, by life and circumstance and, and shit that happens. And so if somebody is being rude to you or someone's yelling at you or they're being aggressive, t- for me, I just take that deep breath and say, start with kindness. 99% of the time you're talking to a good person with a good heart that is kind and somewhere along the way, it just got a bit fucked up. So let's help them get back to that. And I think that that is the intention with, you know, everyone in government and what they're trying to do in aged care and, and NDIS. Do I have rose colored glasses? Quite possibly. But does that help me get through the day? Absolutely. (laughs) I don't think being more cynical about it would um, actually garner a better result. So I choose to believe. It's, it's super hard though. Like, especially the bigger the organization you're dealing with, like I hate banks. I hate the big, but it's like, 
whenever I like ring, I have to deal with them. It's always like, okay, the person I'm talking to is not like the person responsible for like this situation, but it's ultimately mm. the issue is, but you're, there is no one person that is going to be held like accountable or they can like answer the question. You know? Yes. So yeah, I feel your pain. Yeah. And look, I don't always get it right. I literally stormed out of a Telstra store on the weekend because the person was rude to me and I couldn't get what I wanted. So I stormed out. And as I was walking out, I was like, that's not starting with kindness. Abby, (laughs) it's not giving that person the opportunity to be kind, but you know, (laughs) we're all human. Um, all right, so we've, we've had the, we've, I had a little bit of the past and the back, sorry. We've, we've had, you know, a little bit of the present and, and what we're currently doing and, and what's, what's the future look like? I guess you kind of alluded to it just there. You, you're bringing in a, a new GM so that you can take a bit more of a step, I guess, away from, from the, the nourished day-to-day and more kind of into that, um, that value system and, and kind of push in those more philanthropic kind of endeavours. Yeah, well, I really want to be able to say what can we do with this vision outside of food and how can we do more of that? Um, and also I needed to hire for my weaknesses. There's things that I'm shit at and it's not fair on my team to have to deal with that all the time. So um, I read this really great book, Rocket Fuel, that talks about visionaries and integrators. And we recognize that this company has a visionary and that I'm pretty good at that but I'm not good at the integrator part of it, which is giving the team enough support to do their jobs or following through on all the systems and the processes or um, being as operationally savvy or caring as much about operational stuff as I should. So we, we literally wrote a list of what are my weaknesses here? And we went to the team and asked them what they were. Um, and then we went out and hired for that. And so, yeah, Taryn is coming in in a couple of weeks and we're hoping that, well, the idea, and I'm pretty confident in it is that, yeah, she will run the day to day of the company. She'll make sure that not only product gets out and customers get served the way that they should, but at at just this level of excellence, that's unmatched, um, anywhere else. Their current goal is to have the best customer experience in Australia, not just in food, across the board we want people to come to nourish first and foremost for the way that they'll feel when they interact with us um and then yeah i get to say okay how else can we have real and positive impact i would love to host meetups and lunches for our clients living with disabilities in cities all over australia because we've identified they've identified that loneliness is such a big problem so how do we bring some people together just to have lunch together and bring in the support workers that we might need to help with that so that their carers who are generally unpaid family members can go and have some time to themselves and how do i find some time to sit with other startups in the aged care space and say okay what are we going to do over here how do we make some change god i'd love to just take my team into some of the nursing homes and retirement villages that i've been privileged enough to visit recently and just talk to people you know have that impact i i really respect companies that have these big visions right that are going to affect millions of people in one go you know elon musk when he does things or branson when he does things i think that they're fucking amazing but I also truly believe in the ripple effect of just one act. And so when we can do these small things when I can bring six people together to have a lunch and then they go back and they're kinder to their carers and then they're kinder to the next person they meet. Like I just want kindness to spread like fucking COVID did across the globe. Um, Yeah. I think that that's kind of where I'm going to be spending some more time. And look, I want to spend some more time with my kids. They're two and three. And, um, My husband is amazing and has been the primary caregiver for probably the past 12 to 18 months. So I I want a bit of space to spend some time with them and, and know them at this age. Yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) Sorry. That got big. (laughs) That was good. It's good. It's hard not to get caught up in it too. Right. And I think Mm. um, the whole reason I started doing this podcast was really to, learn from other people and, and, and sort of see how others are, are doing things and going about it. And ultimately to, to try to find different people that uh, my vision kind of aligns somewhat to their vision. And then it's an opportunity to, okay, well, how can we help each other? You know? yep. um, and so this has definitely been one of my favorite recordings of the podcast. Cause you obviously, uh... 
you obviously are so passionate about what you're doing, what you're trying to do and, and what you, know, you, you feel you're capable of doing, which is awesome. But I think from um, my own personal experience with the customer care team and everyone that I've dealt with at Nourish, it's not just like fluff and like, oh yeah, we put our values up on the wall over here. It's like everyone that I've spoken to is obviously super bought into to what um, you guys are trying to do, whether it is the like, the gym rat that's ordering, you know, and I've had a couple of my PT clients that I know that have ordered and they've forgotten to put like a code or a coupon and it's just been <laughs> experienced to sort it out on, on the other end. They're like, Oh, they're so nice. They're so nice. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everyone really lives the values. We call each other on the values. You know, I might say something, one of the team will be like, mm, is that thinking without limitations or not? And you're like, yeah, all right. Thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> um it's it's a hard it's a hard dynamic to try to instill right like i always we, we do mental meetings with our coaches and i say like next week i want you to bring something that i need to work on um and luckily for me obviously our coaches don't have too much of an issue with it but <laughs> there's always plenty to work on um yes. but it's, it's it's super important to you know it's i think it's not just like job security in, in terms of having someone to come and work but a place where you can like take risks and speak your mind and all the rest of it and be rewarded for doing so. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I hope that's what we have created. I think it is. Um, I try to check in with the team regularly um, in a lot of ways, both with asking them, but also giving them ways to tell me what's really going on. Cause just sitting down and saying to someone, Hey, what do you think of me? Um, for the most part, they'll tell you how great you are because they're great people. They don't want to hurt your feelings. But um, yeah, I mean, sitting down and writing a list of your own weaknesses so you can hire somebody else to fill them is confronting, yeah. um, really confronting. But I did read a book a couple of years ago, Ego is Your Enemy. I wish I'd been given that book when I was 20. Like it, getting my own ego out of the way has been a game changer and absolutely in, in my business in my marriage in my friendships one of my personal values is challenge um, or growth and I think that the only way that I can do that is to have people tell me where I can grow and how to challenge myself because I'm not the most self-aware person and when I am it's because I've worked really hard at it and I've gotten to a place where I'm willing to acknowledge faults or willing to acknowledge weakness and say, yeah, that's something that I'm really working on. Or sometimes just saying, yeah, I, that is a thing and I'm not working on it. That is just who I am. Um, and we're all going to have to accept that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's cool. I think it's, yeah, it's hard to do, but it's again, it's like you've got to lean into that discomfort, right? Like the results. Yeah. Uh, just behind the work you don't really want to do exactly and look life would be easier if you didn't do it and if it like if it's not for other people fine you probably have way less anxiety <laughs> than than i do but that goes back to right the opportunity and the luck thing i get to succeed at some of the things that i do because i'm willing to do the work and i'm willing to face the the harsh realities and have the tough conversations um predominantly about myself to get there I, I'm sure I could have a very good life if I just lived within my own ignorant ego I think a lot of the time ignorance probably is bliss some days I definitely would like that <laughs> that would be really nice but also I just I just enjoy the challenge yeah that's awesome thanks <laughs> What are you what are you currently reading? You mentioned a few different ones that I've got my titles written down here. But what are you yes. Oh, I'm in, I'm so annoying for book recommendations. I will give them constantly. Um, I read at the same time I read Ego is your enemy, stillness is the key, which was a really important one for my mental health at the time. Um, and something that's kind of fallen away for me a bit recently. So I literally just today got back into my meditation practice in the morning. Um, I'm currently reading Obama's A Promised Land, I think it's called. Um, that's my nighttime read. And my business read is Good to Great, which has been like mind-blowing. Um, yeah, have you read it? I've read bits and pieces. It's on my list. I did a piece about the Stockdale paradox. Are you up to that part yet? 
Yeah, I literally just read it yesterday. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I love that. So it's like, I better go and read this whole book. Yeah. I had really avoided it because it was published in like 03. And so I thought, nah, it's way too, I mean, it was before the GFC, but it's super applicable um, mm. to a lot of things. What did I read before that? Uh, Radical Candor, which no one has ever heard of, but is a great management book if you want um, a company that has no bullshit um, and people that just care about each other and moving the mission forward. Um, it's by Kim Scott. And then I'm also reading uh, Principles by Ray Dalio, oh, yeah. which I started about two years ago and I'm just, I'm just plugging my way. You know that thing about tiny steps? I really like it. I think it's so well written and so interesting, but like every line is this like, Oh, truth bomb that I have to go away and think about that. It's taking me literally years to read this book. <laughs> but it's really enjoyable. It's, um, it's hard. I find it. Yeah. It's hard to just, I find reading like actual reading quite challenging. And I think it's more mm. because I don't know how to read, but I, number one to like make the time to simply just read and not to think about anything else. And I often find like, I'll read a page, get to the end of the page, but like, I've been thinking about something else like the last five minutes and I've completely missed what I'm reading. Yep. Um, so I do a lot of audible. You meditate? Not really. I do like um, gratitude journaling and stuff like that. Yes. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, which helps. I read um, The Resilience Project by Hugh Van, uh, Van Clyde. He's in Australia. Yeah, it's on my list. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, and uh, so he sort of talks about that and, and he has a journal just right here on my desk that comes with the book. Yes. And so it's like all these prompts and you kind of do it daily for, for 10 minutes. Yeah, mine is, I don't have that one, but my one is back here. This is where I do my uh, gratitude and meditation every morning. My little one's back there Beautiful. as well. It's one of the things we did with our team as well, because, you know, disability is really hard. Um, we hear a lot of, of different stories and we, we deal with a lot of different people that have different disabilities. Um, and so all of our team have gratitude journals and that's the last thing they do it should be the last thing they do before they leave every day so that the last thing they think about is not something negative yeah. <laughs> that it's just even if all it is is like oh the coffee was really good today because some some days that is all you got yeah. but it's kind of the last thing you leave with but i asked that about meditating because i find the same like i'm trying to read and my brain is just like wearing at a million miles an hour. And so I find if I do like a three to five minute meditation on like headspace or calm before I read, it kind of clears my space a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Something to try. I'm trying to get better at actually um, applying what I'm reading. Like, oh, like, uh, yes. Like, oh, that's really good. And then like onto the next thing. So I'm trying to like take like, okay, if I like that, why did I like that? And if, if that is something that I identify with, how am I going to actually build this, um, mm -hmm. what I'm doing? Yeah, I would do the same. I was very much like, it, it was almost, you were winning how many, with how many books you read. Yeah. So just, okay, read this in the next one. The next one. I was like, wait, a minute, I actually have my whole life. Um, that's I okay. Do, you. I do sometimes like feel bad that there's like so much wisdom out there and I'm just not going <laughs> to. <laughs> eh, half of it's the same shit anyway sometimes i get halfway through a book and i'm like no nah, that's just that one move on i mean and to be fair i generally only read about 75 percent as well yeah. just my behavior type I, i'm done by then unless it's like really riveting i'm like yeah okay i feel like i've got enough out of this one i'll move on now i generally find if i'm reading like if you're especially when you read management and leadership stuff which is a lot of like what i read simon cynic may brown like that kind of stuff yeah um I'm like, okay, if they keep touching on the same principles, like this is probably one of the things I should write down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they, Work on that. Enough for these guys to keep referring back to, it's going to be good enough for me. Yep. Easy. Thank you very much for your time. I think we've been going for about an hour and a half, which has been awesome. Ah, oh, um, which I promised I wouldn't do. I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry if it's, if it's kicked out the, the rest of your schedule for the day, but um, no, I really enjoyed the chat. Thanks so much. And, and hopefully the first of a few, I think we've got a couple of topics that, um yes. could kind of circle around and 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 um deep dive into as well which would be awesome um so to anyone listening if you've made it this far great job and <laughs> <laughs> if not read the cliff notes um <laughs> thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it i love doing these and i'm always like 
so little fangirly when I get asked to. So I really thank you so much. No worries at all. Thanks. And I guess thanks for being so accessible too, right? Um, so yeah, it was a pretty pain-free experience to, to get you on. Sometimes it can be tough to nail a guest down and, and actually get a time and then not move it six or seven times. So I really... Oh, no. All good. Awesome. Thanks, Abby. Thank you.